six. We're at six towards that 200. So remember that, keep the bar low. That's so cool. We joined this up, so we're cool. So um, brochures are spread throughout the room. Feel free to pick one up. There's a form in there. Should you be interested in supporting and becoming uh, even more full capacity supporting our, our work? Um, it definitely ensures a healthy future uh, for all of us who work, play, and live in, in these watersheds here. Um, another commemoration that we want to raise our glass to is to Vernon County residents, Carolyn and Kevin Park, who have not only been awarded the Conservation Farmers of the Year for Vernon County, but last week they were recognized at the state for being the Conservation Farmers of the Year. Wow. So we can give them a round of applause. It's quite an honor. It's the second time that Vernon County has had Conservation Farmer of the Year in the last five years. Um, there will be an event, uh, a more formal event for uh, festivities at their farm coming uh, Thursday, August 6th. So you can put that as a save the date with more details to come. Another uh, glass can be raised to uh, Crawford County residents and also Tana Creek Watershed Council members, Bruce and Sue Ristro, who have been awarded the 2020 Volunteer Stream Monitoring uh, winners by UW Madison Division of Extension wow. and Wisconsin DNR. It's incredible work that they've done. So thank you. Finally, we raise a glass to ourselves. Why? Because the community here supports this conservation on TAPS and makes the success that it is. I want to thank you for coming out and ask you by a show of hands, how many folks here in the room tonight have attended at least two of our conservation on TAPS this winter season? Okay, and how about three? And how about the, all four of them thus far? <laughs> so that, wow, that is great. So your sustained support is definitely uh, most appreciated as for your donations to make this possible. If you haven't already had a chance to do so, we have a glass jar in the front and just know that any money that you can put towards this goes directly to fund the Conservation on Tap program. Um, so, in terms of housekeeping, if you aren't already aware, there's bathrooms through the double doors and through, uh, through the building on the right-hand side. Um, we will uh, take a break midway through to refill our glasses, but feel free to do it, it along the way. <coughs> and I will now introduce our speaker, Armin Barks, who is our Driftless Area Ecologist for the Wisconsin DNR's National Heritage Conservation Program. Um, the focus of his career in the last 21 years has been the inventory management and protection of Wisconsin's rare species and natural communities, with a focus on remnant prairie and savanna. Stationed in La Crosse, he is responsible for the management of 12 DNR-owned state natural areas in a seven-county area. Armand is very familiar with the driftless area biodiversity and is excited to share with us his passion and enthusiasm tonight. Without further ado, please welcome Armand Barks. Well, well, good evening and welcome. I'm going to have to find a spot to stand here so folks can see the screen. Um, I'm wondering about that. Would it be okay if I just jumped down yeah. here? Yeah. Well, as Monique said, I, I'm a Wisconsin DNR employee. work for the Bureau of Natural Heritage Conservation, formerly the Endangered Resources Program. And over that time, as you mentioned during the introduction, I've the focus of my career really has been remnant prairies, savannas, and open oak woodlands in this part of the state, being responsible for managing a lot of our state natural areas. Our state natural areas program is a system that protects the highest quality examples of relatively intact habitat types, or what we call natural communities. So. Um, over the last 22 years, I've learned quite a bit about prairies, and if you're familiar with prairies already, I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to maybe enlighten you, teach you a few things you might not have known about prairies, and if you don't know anything about prairies, I'm hoping that I will take you on the journey of discovery and perhaps instill a little enthusiasm and passion for this rare habitat type natural community as well. So I think with that, I'll get started here. Um, just a little bit of an overview. I'm going to take you through pre-settlement times up through today, so a little of the background there. What types of prairies do we have here in the Driftless area? Uh, I'm going to talk mostly about plants and critters, so it's all the cool things you can find on these sites, essentially. 
I'll touch a little bit about management, and I think sprinkled throughout the talk, I will be able to really be talking about why these places are so special, so unique, and really are the jewels of the Driftless area. Uh, just to get started, um, I don't know what people think, but most people don't know that the Driftless area was probably only 50% forested, maybe even less, before European settlement. So this is an artist's rendition of perhaps people going up the Mississippi River. You can see that trees were, excuse me, trees are limited to just where fire wouldn't get to, little ravines that were moist. Ridge tops, actually the whole Viroqua area was the Coon Prairie, so this was completely treeless, this entire ridge where Viroqua sits today. If you were on a south or west slope, those areas were prairie. Um, there was a lot of oak savanna mixed between. Where trees really were, were on north slopes, and that's where it was a moist, cool place, and fire generally didn't get to those places. Well, what happened? European settlement came and that sort of thing. Uh, here's just another artist's rendition of, I think this was along the Wisconsin River. Why were these areas open? Um, probably somewhere between four and 7,000 years ago, there was a time period that we call the hypsothermal, and that was a super hot, dry period, and that's when we, what we call the Prairie Peninsula moved from the west to the east. So it was super hot, super dry. Native Americans set the landscape on fire for a number of reasons. Um, it made the grass much greener after fire passed through, and the grass was much more nutritional, so it attracted game. In this particular photo, perhaps they used it to drive game, that sort of thing. Fire stimulates nuts and berry production. And if you saw Jim Thieler's talk here not too long ago, I think he spoke this year, um, you know, he talked about the Native Americans and how, you know, they moved around quite a bit, but if you think you had to survive through the winter and you were in some back hollow and you needed to collect firewood to get through an entire winter, I do believe that Native Americans probably set fire in areas to kill trees and because they were nomadic in nature, they might not return to that same place for four or five years, so when they returned, they had a lot of dead trees to collect firewood from. Now that's just my wild guess, my wag, right? Um, so, you know, there was a lot of reasons Native Americans set fire to the landscape. Um, then Europeans came, we started settling the landscape and stuff like that, so what did we do? There weren't a lot of trees on the landscape. We cut the trees that there were to build houses and for fence posts. You can still see a lot of white oak fence posts on the landscape still today on old farms. A lot of cedar posts were used for fences, but here's just another example of what the landscape looked at that time. There's a lot of little small trees. We call these oak grubs. Oak survives fire, especially bur oak, really nicely. So the top of the tree will get killed essentially, but those roots will keep growing and growing and can live for hundreds and hundreds of years. They just keep re-sprouting. Well, when you remove fire from the landscape, essentially, those trees grew up. So European settlers came. We don't want fire burning down our homesteads and stuff like that. Smoky Bear even came into the picture. We fought fire. We, the trees, that's how, what produced all the trees today, was simply taking fire off the landscape. And that's why we have predominantly a forested landscape, at least from Viroqua West in this part of the Driftless area. Um, this photo I like, um, this is not my burn crew, but <laughs> what I want to point out is when you, you, you know, libraries are wonderful places to look at old historic photos and stuff like that, historical societies, but just want to point out, you know, that this is maybe an early 1900 photo, a lot of tree, you know, not a lot of trees on this hillside, but that's all prairie there essentially. Um, this is actually Nelson Dewey State Park. This is actually a state natural area right up here. Today it is. But this is the stone building at Nelson Dewey State Park that's still there today. And I took a photo, there's a photo of this in that building, so I just took a picture of that to show you. But now let's look at this hillside today. And if you focus on this little point, I'll show you what this looks like today. So here is that little point right there. 
So pretty much, again, just like I said, you take fire off the landscape, everything just grows up to trees. So that's kind of, you know, the past bringing us up to present day. Um, just looking at a statewide overview, um, if you look at all prairie types, so we have prairies that are on the wet end of the spectrum, wet prairies all the way to the dry end of the spectrum. So if you look at all those prairie types, we have over 400 species of native plants that are found on these. Uh, a really high diversity of especially invertebrates, but there's also quite a few reptiles. There's, there's a handful of birds depending on the prairie type and how big the prairie is and that sort of thing, but a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, once covered 2.1 million acres. Less than 10,000 acres remain today in Wisconsin, and the Driftless area is the heart of the prairie remnants that remain in, in the state. And that is because the, steep, the steepness of the country, we've plowed up all the prairie, essentially. So Mesic Prairie, which is what is now our farm ground, makes, there's 100 acres of that in Wisconsin. The largest remnant in Iowa is 200 and some acres, Hayden Prairie in northeast Iowa. So we found it all up. So really, and so the Mesa Prairie is considered globally imperiled. It's among the most decimated habitat types, natural communities in the entire world. And Dry Prairie, it's because we still have about 10,000 acres left, but most of it's going quickly and becoming overgrown with trees. Dry Prairie isn't quite as rare, but it's still considered globally rare. So really prairies, you know, produce the deep, rich agricultural soils that we have today. The roots go very deep down into the soil profile, five to 10 feet deep. Those roots die periodically and leave organic matter very deep within the soil profile. So they're part of our history, they're a part of our culture, a link to the past and a potential resource for the future. And we really owe a lot of America's wealth to prairies that we plowed up. Um, now I'm going to just start getting into prairie, and you might have heard me use the term habitat type or natural community type. I just want to explain a little bit about that. So a natural community is an assemblage of associated plants and animals repeated across the landscape. So I think most of us are familiar with, say, our oak forest here. We would call it, as an ecologist, that would be called a southern dry music forest. That's the natural community type. So a prairie is just a different natural community type of an assemblage of plants and animals that are repeated across the landscape. So this is an example of a dry prairie. This is Battle Bluff State Natural Area. This is in southwest Vernon County along Highway 35, part of our state natural area system. And we have over 650 state natural areas throughout the entire state of Wisconsin, again, protecting the highest quality examples of remaining natural communities that we still have. Um, here is where we did a prescribed burn, actually, on just a portion of this hill, focusing on the brush. Um, this is Rush Creek State Natural Area. This is in northern Crawford County, um, just between DeSoto and Ferryville, Wisconsin. This is kind of a cool shot in that shows you a continuum of natural community types. So the continuum, here's the dry prairie, prairie grass here. Here is what we would call open oak woodlands that's had a lot of prescribed fire. Here is a floodplain forest, Rush Creek forest, bottomlands, you know, same thing you'd see out in the Mississippi River. And then there's that southern dry music forest, just the standard type oak stuff you would see. So four natural community types in this partic particular photo to show you. Uh, that's a 2,600 acre public property, so a really cool, amazing site. Uh, this is a photo of it from Highway 35. It's This archipelagos of Bluff Prairies is one of the largest archipelagos in the upper Midwest. There's some pretty large archipelagos, and what I mean by that is just, you know, a string of prairies, you know, in a long string like that. So the Rip River in southeast Minnesota has quite a few, um, but this is some of the largest prairies you're going to see in the state of Wisconsin, essentially. Actually, last weekend, we just burned half of this one. We came right down this point and burnt this hillside, so if you drive by now, you'll see that part black. 
The other half of it we did not burn, and I'll get into why we only burned a portion of that. Um, this is Battle Bluff State Natural Area. It's that same prairie I showed you before. Here's Minnesota. Here's Iowa on the other side of the Mississippi. This is the foreground prairie right here. This is the Battle Hollow portion of it, but just to illustrate a few plants that are out there, this is Myatris or Blazing Star. This probably grows in a lot of people's yards right here in Viroqua, so a lot of these plants are you know, used for landscape plants and that sort of thing. If you look at nature too and flowers and plants out in nature, they're often this purple and yellow combination in the fall. You got goldenrods and asters. Here's uh, golden rock, uh, great, uh, a particular golden rod, stiff golden rod and blazing star, and purple and yellow are opposite on the color wheel. If you're, my mother was an artist, so it's the only reason I know that. But So you'll see that repeated in nature. I don't know why exactly. It might have to do with pollination or something like that. But um, here is after a prescribed fire. You know, I've talked with and worked with locals, and you know, I mean, locals who have been here for a hundred years, their families, and you know, they pretty much looked at those old worthless bald hillsides where even trees don't grow. But you know, you get them up on that hill after a burn and you show them what's out there, and even they are quite impressed with what's there. So, some wood batony here, pretty cool, true Indian paintbrush, birdfoot violet. I mean, these sites after a prescribed burn are just amazing coming to life with flowers and pollinators and all sorts of really cool stuff. Um, this is not a garden. This is black earth prairie, essentially, but butterfly milkweed here. Um, so monarch butterflies could use this as a host plant. Actually, butterfly milkweed is the only milkweed that doesn't have white sap that has clear sap. It's kind of a odd milkweed, but a lead plant. You know, some of these plants, like lead plant can live, and compass plant can live 50 to even 100 years. And these grasslands are what I would consider old growth grasslands. Most people don't really think, because they took thousands and thousands of years to develop. So, but just a, a photo of what prairies can look like, Coriopsis out there. But that's a really phenomenal dry music prairie by Black Earth. Amazing site. Um, true Indian paintbrush this is. Um, as a kid, I grew up with a different plant, an invasive species called Indian paintbrush, but I learned this is actually true Indian paintbrush. Most Indian paintbrush is more this red color, so you can imagine if you're out on site, you get hummingbirds all over hitting this Indian paintbrush. Occasionally, you'll get a free plant like this one in yellow. This is called a form. It's just a an, an odd coloration. Sometimes you get white individuals of a particular species, and this, with Indian paintbrush, yellow is the oddball form, essentially, of Indian paintbrush. Um, and this is Rush Creek State Natural Area here. Just some Indian paintbrush out there, more Indian paintbrush. So when you get a lot of that, like I say, I mean, the hummers are really hitting that. Pretty cool. They're just they're buzzing around, zipping. It's just really cool to, to see them out there. That's actually an annual to winter annual, maybe by a, or a biennial plant. Um, prairie phlox is this plant, and then there's compass plant here, the leaves of compass plant. Um, phlox, Europeans came to the United States and they found a number of phlox species, and they actually took that phlox back to Europe. And then they hybridized that, and that's actually how we got today's garden. So I didn't know that until fairly recently. But really cool, pretty plant. Downy flax, prairie flax, two common names for that. Um, downy gentian, this is a really rare, what we call a conservative plant. It's only on, found on the highest quality remnants that we have. Um, I manage only one site that has this particular plant on it. This is a perennial, super rare. I mean, it's not threatened or endangered, but super uncommon on the landscape, and only, again, found in the highest quality habitats there are. Um, fringe gentian, just a gorgeous, gorgeous plant. Um, this is actually found at the Hogback Prairie State Natural Area in central Crawford County. It's 
in a strange place. Normally this is associated with high quality wetlands, so along stream corridors and in sedge meadows and that sort of thing. But the hogback is interesting in that it has an east slope and a west slope. Most of our prairies are on west or south slopes. That east slope is just moist. It has um, a wetland shrub called um, meadowsweet on it, which is really unusual. The only prairie I know of that has meadowsweet. So it has that wetland shrub, but it also has this particular species. There's a phenomenal showing of that this last fall down at the hogback. Um, mustache grass, this is just a little tiny grass and you can see where it gets its name. Um, this will grow in the, the harshest, driest part on these sites. So, you know, if you think it's a south-facing hillside, there's not much soil there essentially. It's exposed to the wind. Water doesn't absorb well because it just runs off on that steep hillside and stuff. But this is more of a western species reaching more of its eastern range limit here in Wisconsin. So again, grows on the extreme sites, extremely harsh, dry sites, but just a cool little grass. Um, side oats grama. It's amazing when you look closely at things. You know, I think people tend to just glance at stuff, but you know, when I found this individual in full bloom, I just I was so surprised at how beautiful the grass was when it was in bloom. I mean, who thinks of grasses as really being colorful or pretty or anything, but, you know, all the reproductive structures showing a little red and stuff like that, but a really cool grass. Host to a number of rare um, butterflies, actually, this particular grass, and some of the other prairie grasses as well. Um, thistles, you know, I think... Thistles get a bad rap, and, you know, I would say, you know, we have a federally listed thistle in the state of Wisconsin called dune thistle, so it grows along the shores of the Great Lakes, but we've developed and trashed, unfortunately, most of the shores and the natural dunes along the Great Lakes, so that thistle's federally listed. This is actually a state-listed thistle, so it's listed as state-threatened. Um, it is what they call a monocarpic perennial, so this one, all our native thistles are very non-aggressive, but this one will live five to ten years as a basil rosette like this, and then it'll send up flowers and bloom one time, and then for the most part die, dies back, and there is a technical botanical reference called Gleason and Cronquest, and it says it's a monocarpic perennial, which means it should truly die. I've grown this one for about 10 to 15 years, and guess what? It's not truly a monocarpic perennial. It does have some rhizomatous nature to it. After it dies back, it will shoot up little rhizomes, and you'll get a little basal rosette off to the side. So through growing some of these plants, I've learned quite a bit about these too. Um, there's other native thistles too. Um, pasture thistle or field thistle, that's the same species, Circeum discolor and tall thistle, Circeum altissimum, right? A lot of these Latin names have a meaning and, and stuff, but those are biennial thistles. So biennial thistles aren't really that aggressive. Um, they're really easy to control, but thistles are so important for pollinators, for hummingbirds. I had hernia surgery one time a number of years back, and I was stuck at home and had um, pasture thistle in my backyard, essentially, and you would not believe the hummingbirds that came to that, to nectar, um, the butterflies, the monarchs that landed on that, the bees, and then, of course, when it went to seed, you know, the goldfinches just pounded. It was like, it was just a, an awesome show. It's like, I don't have to, you know, there, I just look out the window and I got a show all day, pretty much, just watching thistles. So, <laughs> this, thistles definitely get a bad rap, so we need to support our thistles. <laughs> this is hill, th hill thistle in bloom. Usually it only has one flower, but it only grows maybe one to two feet tall. So, and there's, there's populations fairly close to Viroqua. I know east of Viroqua toward the Kickapoo, there's a population on private land I'm aware of. Um, it grows at the Hogback. It's on a few other sites too, but pretty darn uncommon being state-threatened. 
Um, orchids, ladies' tresses orchids. There are at least two ladies' tresses orchids that can be found on prairies. This is Great Plains ladies' tresses. You identify this one by smelling it, and it's just amazing what it smells like. I can't even really describe it, but it's like just this heavenly perfume, you know. It's so really cool. And then there's October's ladies' tresses, too, which is a special concern ladies' tresses orchid, and we probably only have about 10 populations in that, of that in the state. We're trying to collect information on that to really assess it better, but so far we know of about 10 populations. Um, prairie lily or wood lily, this isn't, you know, ditch lily, this isn't day lilies. You're, you're not going to see this growing in a ditch except near my house in <laughs> Iowa, in northeast Iowa, where my neighbor has a remnant prairie that comes right up to the road ditch, and that's been grazed and pastured over. Well, you can imagine this is cattle candy, so they love it. But right out between that fence and the road, there's a pretty good population, so this is a place I like to collect seed from. But gorgeous, they're extremely conservative, uh, only found on the highest quality sites. Really gorgeous. Um, yellow star grass, it's not a grass. It's actually in the amaryllis family, so some folks might be familiar you can grow amaryllis in the winter and they bloom and you can buy them at Shopko. Well, maybe not Shopko anymore, but you know, you can buy them at stores and get them to bloom. So this is a little tiny <laughs> mini, mini amaryllis that's only two or three inches tall. Amazingly, I mean, not amazingly, but super difficult to collect these seeds. I mean, on a plant that's only three inches tall, you're on your hands and knees and that sort of thing. Um, bird's foot violet. Um, there's two violets that grow on remnant prairies, so bird's foot violet to prairie violet. And the leaves are, it's called bird foot because they're sort of divided like a bird's foot, divided, you know, sort of like by hand. And, and that's an adaptation. You know, if you're out in some hot, dry climate and you're exposed to the wind and sun all the time, you want to protect and preserve your moisture. So you don't want a lot of leaf exposed to the sun. Now, if you're in the woods, you want, you want your solar panel, excuse me, I get a little excited, right? <laughs> if you're in the woods, you know, you want your solar panel fully exposed and trying to get all that sun because it's coming through the shade of the trees and stuff. So our state flower, you know, the woodland violet or woodland blue violet has the heart shape. Well, these violets don't. An interesting thing about these violets is this is the host plant for a state endangered butterfly called the regal fritillary butterfly right here. And today I actually have one of my volunteer violet growers that grows violets um, for me, violet seed. And we plant the seed at the Hogback Prairie State Naturalary because we have a population of this butterfly. And right now there's about 10 populations, eight to 10 populations in the state, but there's really only four places in the state that you can consistently see this butterfly. And the Hogback Prairie State Natural Area in Central Crawford County is one of those four sites. So what we're trying to do there is, and another interesting thing about this butterfly is it's an area sensitive butterfly. So maybe you've heard that certain bird species need you know, like an upland sandpiper might be two, three, four hundred acres of open grassland. It's, it, it won't be found in smaller areas than several hundred acres, as an example. Well, this butterfly needs about a hundred acres or more of grassland. The remnant prairie at the hogback is a 60-acre remnant. And then there's a valley bottom where we're storing and planting prairie, and that's where my volunteer seed producer, seed grower, collect, um, grows plants, collects that seed for me, and then we're able to plant the host plant in our plantings. And we've largely connected the big remnant at the hogback through these valley bottom plantings to all these little archipelagos of remnants surrounding that. So we're trying to expand the habitat for the state endangered regal fritillary butterfly. And that site was a Nature Conservancy owned site for many years. I think they got that in the mid-90s roughly. Um, the prairie enthusiasts actually discovered this site. Um, DNR's County Biological Survey 
wasn't done. And this is a survey that surveyed every county just to see what did Wisconsin have in it. That wasn't done until the mid-1970s, and our county biological survey staff missed the hogback prairie because it was heavily grazed. Well, the prairie enthusiasts came, and somehow they saw that there were some interesting things and got permission to go check that, and they discovered that prairie, and then the Nature Conservancy went and worked with those landowners, and you know, the people around Steuben, Wisconsin, they're pretty anti-government, and the Nature Conservancy was able to, you know, work their way in there and stuff like that and start purchasing land, and not too long ago, the Nature Conservancy went through a period where they essentially divested some of these properties because staff were pretty much limited to Madison, Wisconsin, so they gave that to the state of Wisconsin. So I've been the property manager of that site since 2015, and I feel really proud to be a property manager for that site and to have such responsibility in my hands of that site and all the rare species there. Um, this is compass plant, and I think this is going to be my last slide for now because I would like to have a beer, um, have a little taste, give you all a chance to fill up and stuff. But if you're familiar with Aldo Leopold's writings, and he has a, he is a, you know, one of the, a well-known conservationist, the father of wildlife management and that sort of thing. But he talked about this plant in his writings and a prairie funeral and how the only place it grew was in a cemetery because outside the cemetery everything's plowed up or mowed and it was in a corner of a cemetery where they just couldn't get the mower into it. This survived and then they took the fence out and guess what, mowed it down and stuff. But this plant can live to be 100 years old, it's amazing. And actually there is a tiny population really close to Viroqua and I botanize going 55 all the time, shame on me, but um, on Highway 8227, when you go south of town off of 14, if you go about two or three miles down that road, there is a quarry on the south side of the road. On the north side of the road, there's just a strip right along the highway with maybe 20 compass plant. I tried to collect seed there, they, they weren't viable, but... Um, so I think we'll hold here. I've got quite a few more slides. And um, I, I should say, too, that if folks, I was going to say, if you had any questions that were simple questions during the talk, I mean, I could take those. But otherwise, I'll be around afterwards, too, and stuff like that. But why don't we just take a few moments now and refill and stuff like that and regroup in five to eight minutes or something like that. Since I talk so much, <laughs> um, there are stem borers that are host. This is the only plant that these borers will use, so it's an insect that will bore in and live in there, and it might turn into a little butterfly or a little moth, actually moths, I should say. And there are actually hyperparasitoids and parasitoid wasps that will only live on that particular moth that lives within compass plants, so all sorts of really interesting you know, connections and stuff like that with plants like this. Um, so now we, we went from the hill prairies, also called bluff prairies, dry prairies, or locally a goat prairie because they're so steep, pretty much you almost have to be a goat to, to be on them and climb up them. But this is another prairie type that we have in the Driftless area. Um, this is sand prairie. So you would imagine these sand prairies are found along river areas along the Mississippi River. This is Holland Sand Prairie State Natural Area. Um, a conservation organization, Mississippi Valley Conservancy, actually um, brokered this deal and worked with the town of Holland, and the town of Holland actually put a tax on themselves to pay for this site. So this is just north of La Crosse, but in the springtime, um, a lot of spider wart, Coon out there. So an interesting, and of course sand isn't really good agricultural soil, so without irrigation there's still remnants of that around, but with irrigation we've destroyed a lot of those remnants. This is actually the La Crosse Airport Sand Prairie, so if you've ever been there, this is a 60 acre remnant. Um, look at this cocoon, I mean it's just gorgeous. What a f That would be such an awesome landscape plant if we knew how to grow it, but 
very few people, it's very difficult to grow. Um, lithosperm of rock seed, that's, that's the genus for the plant, so very difficult to figure out how to germinate the seed. But this prairie was actually under threat, um, and I was involved with that through my job, in that the airport wanted to expand a runway there. And get this, they wanted to take sand off the sand prairie to fill in wetland to expand their <laughs> runway. So, <laughs> so, I mean, kind of a double whammy there. And fortunately, independent butterfly researchers on their 4th of July butterfly count found regal fritillary butterflies, not here, but at the Tremplo National Wildlife Refuge. And because of that, I was able to get the airport folks to hire expert lepidopterists, so these are butterfly moth experts, um, people that did plants and birds, and I had this whole site inventoried, and although we, and see, if we can find an endangered animal, plants are not legally protected on private land, but they are legally protected on public land, and this is public land. Although we found no threat in our endangered species, the airport realized that this place was really special. So that year, at least, we were able to thwart that. It's a constant battle, though, trying to maintain and not have them screw stuff up and stuff like that. But the expert lepidopterist, Les Furby, he's a moth expert. Lepidopterist is moths and butterflies. He found four new species to the state of Wisconsin at the site. This was the most exciting place he had surveyed in 10 years. So he was thrilled to do survey work here, but an amazing sand prairie. Um, this is Harry Pacoon, and this illustrates uh, several things here. So what happened here is, in managing prairies, we often cut brush. And a typical thing is to take brush and pile it and burn piles. So that's what happened here is this was an old burn pile out on the sand prairie, so you can see the, the charcoal left from the fire of burning that brush pile. But the pecoon roots go so deep into the ground that, you know, even though maybe that ground was sterilized four or five e inches down into the soil, that pecoon grew up. And next door to, this is the Holland sand prairie here, next door is Beaver Builders, this is a construction company. Um, they actually destroyed some prairie, and they bulldozed a foot deep through sand prairie. Pacoon grew up. It still survived. And that also illustrates you can't really transplant many of these plants either because those roots are so deep. And the other thing this illustrates is having open sand created habitat for a really interesting critter, a tiger beetle. I think we have somewhere around 16 to 18 species of tiger beetles in the state of Wisconsin. Some of them are quite rare. They like open sand, so when you do that, they created some habitat that was useful for the tiger beetle. So pretty cool there. Um, sand milkweed. This is at the La Crosse Airport, sand prairie essentially. Um, this is one of about 11 milkweed species we have in the state of Wisconsin. Pretty uncommon. It's also called wavy leaf milkweed because the leaves are kind of wavy and stuff. But really interesting flower head on it, inflorescence they call that. But really cool plant. You can see it's growing pretty much in just bare sand. So these, these plants are quite adapted to really harsh conditions. Um, silky prairie clover. There's a number of prairie clovers, purple prairie clover, and white prairie clover. This is the rarest. This is a special concern plant in the state of Wisconsin, limited to western Wisconsin, but it does go up fairly far north. Um, up in the northern Wisconsin, near Crex Meadows, where there is Barron's habitat, which is sort of like prairie, but it's got um, heaths in it, ericaceous shrubs like blueberries and stuff like that, so it's a little different habitat type, but Kind of a really cool, rare, uncommon plant. And just since I noticed, this is actually um, western ragweed. And ragweed we usually think is a total weed, but this is a perennial ragweed, where our common ragweed, you know, that people get, you know, sneeze allergies and stuff from, those are annuals, but this is actually a perennial ragweed, that western, western ragweed. <laughs> Um, cactus. 
Um, I would think most people don't know we actually have cactus in Wisconsin. I learned about cactus when I was a child. I grew up in Milwaukee. I moved to Driftless when I was 18. I saw the light at a very young age. <laughs> and um, you know, as soon as I got out of high school, boom, I moved right to DeSoto, Wisconsin, Crawford County. But we often traveled Highway 14 in the Spring Green area. And you know, I grew up in a family that we would often stop and look at stuff on roadsides. My mother taught me a lot of plants. My grandfather taught me birds and stuff like that. My brother's just like, hey, I think I'm seeing cactus. And we're like, yeah, right, you're, you know, what a yacht or whatever. But, you know, he's, oh, no, I really think I see cactus. So we pulled over, and lo and behold, there's this prickly pear cactus. And, you know, we were just blown away. We thought this was some southwestern species. But, yep, prickly pear cactus, it grows mostly in riverine areas throughout Wisconsin, so the lower Wisconsin River, um, going up into Adams County, um, along the Mississippi River, there's some at Holland Sand Prairie, up near La Crosse, Holland Sand Prairie State Natural Area, uh, along the Black River, along the lower Chippewa River, so outwash sands where you get that real harsh, dry sand conditions for the species to grow. It blooms around June 15th to June 25th, so if you're on Highway 14 heading to Madison at that time, look in the road ditches and you'll see this plant blooming. Uh, here's a fruit of prickly pear cactus right there. Um, here is a different species. This one's either state threatened or endangered, but this is brittle prickly pear cactus, and this is a, a colleague of mine, Nate Tucker, took this. This is at Fort McCoy Military Base up in Monroe County. It rarely ever blooms, this particular cactus, but pretty cool if you walk through patches, it'll stick into your boots and stuff. <laughs> and if that happens, they might come home with me, you know, that type of a thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> sand cancer root, this is a, a really, it's a, there's no chlorophyll in this plant. So this plant is actually attaching its roots to other plants. I think it's saprophytic, they call that. Um, but it's attaching its roots to other plants and getting nutritional value from that. But super rare, state threatened. I've never seen this one myself, but I do know there's a population in the bluffs above the city of La Crosse on their bluff prairies that, that the city actually manages in La Crosse, which is pretty cool. Um, clustered poppy mallow. Clustered poppy mallow is, is a Midwest species, essentially. Wisconsin probably has the largest population. Just about every state surrounding us, it's considered rare. It's considered special concern in Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin probably has that largest population, and it's at the La Crosse Airport Sand Prairie. And this is the host for one of those moths that Les Fergie found. It's a, it's a Malvaceae, so this is, that's the family it's in, mallow family essentially, but that, this is the host plant for one of those moths that was a new species that he found, a new state record, so it was associated with this particular plant. Pretty cool. If you drive up to the airport, and of course you can't go through the fence, but you can drive along the fence and you could look in. And even outside of the fence, there's some little tiny populations of this clustered poppy mallow there. Um, this is a really cool little prairie fern, which is quite unusual. Prairie dune ward, it's state endangered. Um, it only grows two inches tall, so you can imagine this would be really hard to survey for. I was fortunate enough to survey a two full days for this with an expert and we didn't find any but um you know perhaps it's more common than what we think uh the best time to survey would be after a prescribed burn where you don't have all this duff to look through and i actually live at the base of a remnant prairie in northeast iowa surprise surprise right and there is a population of this just on my neighbors on the same remnant, and I own part of the remnant, he owns part of the remnant, so pretty cool. So I have at least finally found this one myself, but really cool, unusual little fern. Um, now we're kind of switching gears, going from plants into some of the critters, and I will warn you that I am going to be talking about some 
reptiles on the prairie, and that includes snakes. So just if some people have a phobia to that, so you know if you need to leave or something, I understand. <laughs> but um, this is prairie race runner lizard. We have four species of lizards in Wisconsin. Most of them are pretty uncommon or rare. This is special concern. Around here at our bluff prairies, we'd have this one and five line skinks. Actually, in La Crosse, we do have the state endangered slender glass lizard, which is a legless lizard. Pretty cool, pretty rare. So, I got an interesting story, and maybe some of you have heard this, but I have a friend, he's a reptile expert, Matt Heater. He does programs for the Myrick Hickson Eco Park in La Crosse, and he's the type of guy that when I met him, he had this like frog in his hand, and it hopped out of his hand, and he just goes like this and catches it. And he's like one of those hacky sack players. I'm like, holy smoke, man, this dude is like, you know, and he's young and really agile and stuff. And so we went out on site, and I'm like, hey, Matt, you know, I really want to get a picture of a, a six line race runner, you know. And of course, we saw some. They're, they're called race runners for a reason. These things rock. I mean, they're, you know, you. And I'll take binoculars and I'll, I'll see one like run off and I'll try to see maybe where it stopped and try to get a look at it, but you can never get photos of them. So, you know, we're kind of talking and we see some scattered, he just goes running off across the prairie and goes up to some rocks and he's doing, you know, gets one kind of corner and stuff like that and comes up and like walks up to me and you can see how he is very delicately holding this one. He's just holding a toe or two between these two fingers and delicately pinching it there, and he goes, oh, well, this was a gravid female, and that means it's a pregnant female. He goes, oh, so she was easy to catch, she's pregnant. <laughs> I would never even thought of like, trying to run across a steep hillside and catch a lizard by hand. It's like, but I got my photo, right? So this, this photo is out there, too. You'll see this around. So pretty cool, neat critter of the prairie. Um, prairie ringneck snake. I think you're starting to catch on that these species are named for the habitat that they live in. Um, obviously, a really threatening looking snake here. Um, this is a small individual now. They will get to be about a foot long. But this is just sort of a little guy here. This was at Wild Losing State Park, actually. So here's the same species. This is this defense system right here. So what we got going on here is, you know, I flipped a rock. I was actually with Abbey Church of Mississippi Valley Conservancy, and we were inventorying. We were looking actually for a rattlesnake den on private land that they said, yeah, there's a rattlesnake den up there. Well, we didn't see any rattlesnakes, but we just started flipping rocks. And, and the first rock I flipped, I got this prairie green neck snake. So. The first thing they do is they start coiling and moving this red portion of their tail, right? That's what it wants the predators to go to. You'll see here that it protects its head. Here's its head right there. So it's protecting its head because it doesn't want the business end of it eaten by some predator. So pretty cool little snakes, um, gorgeous undersides. I mean, just, just another denizen of the prairie, just really cool. Um, bull snake. Uh, bull snakes are really interesting. You can see, um, well, for one, I had a lot darker hair then, which <laughs> is interesting. <laughs> um, but um, the bull snakes wanted to crawl under my sleeve. And, you know, people tend to give snakes a bad rap, and I handle a lot of snakes. Um, I'm, I'm a snake guy, I can say. And, you know, as long as you're gentle, they might get a little ornery. And I've gotten bit by one bull snake one time. It drew a little blood. It's on a field trip, no big deal or anything. But there's a reason it's trying to crawl up my sleeve there. And it's because they largely spend most of their time underground. So think of what the species does in terms of controlling moles and eastern pocket gophers and stuff like that. So they're really important to, you know, keep things in balance out in nature. Here's a, another woman colleague of mine, Heather Caraca. She's part of Natural Heritage Conservation's BAT program. But, you know, this is at Fort McCoy. But what this photo illustrates is the shape of the head of the bull snake. And these can be six, these can be six foot long animals. These are really formidable, large, really cool critters, you know. This one was freshly shed, 
This one actually has a radio transmitter in it too because they're doing some telemetry work at Fort McCoy. But that head is designed to actually, they don't actually dig themselves, but they're able to move through, through gopher holes and tunnels and underground and push dirt around. And so we have another species in Wisconsin, I don't have a photo, but a black rat snake. And that's Wisconsin's only true arboreal snake. So that snake lives up in trees. And that's restricted to southwest Wisconsin, too. But this is a snake that it's on bluff prairies. So you can find it in hill prairies, but it also likes sand areas, too, like Fort McCoy. And if you can see, this is actually a burned woods here at Fort McCoy there. Uh, timber rattlesnakes, I'm sure people, maybe you are, maybe you're not aware, but we do have timber rattlesnakes in Wisconsin, remnant populations. You know, timber rattlesnake is a lot like a timber wolf, right? It's been heavily feared, persecuted, and misunderstood for, you know, 100 or more years. Um, I, that snake was on a ledge like this, and I took the photo like this. And you can see how ornery and upset she was with me, right? Not at all, you know? Um, really, really cool animals. Um, you know, these critters just want to make a living out on the landscape just like any other critter. This is a postpartum female, so she just gave birth. Her babies are actually, that's actually a baby right there. So she's just like tuckered out, just gave birth. They don't feed the whole year that they give birth. When they give birth, they'll try to go out and get one quick meal before they done up. But I was fortunate enough to do one year of radio telemetry with timber rattlesnakes. Um, they are some of the oldest critters on the landscape. They've had known aged individuals that have lived 35 years. An adult four foot timber rattlesnake, so that's really about as big as they get. 50, about the record, true record in Wisconsin is about 55 inches. So when you hear the guys say, yeah, it's a six foot rattlesnake. No, <laughs> I doubt it. That, that would be like a 40 year old animal or something, but really cool animals. They don't get to reproductive age until they're seven years old, and then they only give birth every three years because the females don't feed that year. It takes them two years to recuperate their lost body weight from not feeding. So really cool animals, really, you know, this is my do not try this at home kids shot. Um, you know, this snake isn't doing, it's, you can hook them and they're not aggressive now. Occasionally you'll get an aggressive one, but most of the time they're just wanting to make a living and, and not, you know, if you leave them alone, they will leave you alone essentially. So really cool animals. And the reason they're associated with prairies is these snakes give birth to live young, so they don't lay eggs, but they need a really hot temperature to incubate the young in their inside. And that temperature needs to be much higher than the surrounding temperatures, say in woodlands or in flat, open areas. So they really need that south-facing slope. They need the rock structure. So really a species tied to bluff prairies or gold prairies. Switching gears just a little bit, and I don't have a ton of slides left, but switching to oak savanna, open oak woodland. Oak savanna is really a generic term for a number of different natural communities. So we would call open oak woodland and oak opening the two savanna types we would have around here. This is actually Fort McCoy, so a little bit of bird foot violet there, scattered oaks with a prairie understory. Um, this is Gasner Hollow State Natural Area in Grant County. This is a rare chinkapin oak savanna, essentially. So this is a chinkapin oak. It's a southern species that makes its northern range limit just south of Prairie Machine in Wisconsin. Uh, a fall shot, but prairie grasses dominating the understory scattered chinkapin oak. Mississippi River out here. Uh, Iowa over there. Um, one of the plants that would be a specialist, if you will, in that particular habitat is the state endangered purple milkweed. Again, one of our about 11 milkweed species we have in Wisconsin. Um, other species associated with open oak woodland, oak savanna, red-headed woodpeckers. You might see them driving between here and Westby on telephone poles. Watch telephone poles, they like those. 
So you can imagine before European settlement, when fire raced across the landscape, it killed trees. So you often had a lot of dead trees, scattered trees on the landscape. That's the habitat. If this is truly one, if you build it, they will come. If you thin out the woods and understory thin, and you have you have the right structure, this bird will show up. So at Rush Creek State Naturally, I did a we understory thin for about 20 years. And we'd have a pair or two, but then I actually had a timber sale, and the timber sale was to simply take out walnut, which was constantly invading our prairie, and we constantly had to cut and herbicide walnut off the prairie. So I'm, and the first walk I took through that woods, we had 10 redheaded woodpeckers. Mm. So just changing the structure just a little bit, and it was like, bam, we just had a ton of redheads in there, which was really cool and awesome. Uh, Northern flicker. Um, whippoorwills. Um, you know, if you've been around Driftless for 20, 30 years, you know that 20 years ago whippoorwills were really common. I mean, you know, when I was 18, 20 years old by DeSoto, I mean, it wouldn't be uncommon to have five to ten I could hear. Now I'm lucky to have one or two there. In Iowa, I get about two to three every year. Um, they're ground nesters, so I've seen four nests in my life. Three of those were on the edges of bluff prairie. That's a whippoorwill there, though, but so they're ground nesters. So what I believe why they've crashed so much in the last 20 years is, one, mesopredators, so a lot of raccoons, possums, skunks. You know, 25 years ago, a raccoon pelt was $25. Every country person that lived in the country, every hillbilly trapped raccoons, their mothers, I mean, you got 25, that's how a lot of the local people made part of their living. They did some farming, they did some, you know, different things. Well, you know, you remove all that trapping, now we have tons and tons of raccoons. So they're finding every nest, so we don't have rough grouse either, so that's another ground nester. Then you combine that with, there's been a big crash in Lepidoptera. Lepidoptera are butterflies and moss, so these actually fit, feed on large moss, and in particular, large silk moss. So we still get a few large silk moss, you know, the Cecropias and Polyphemus and uh, Luna moss, but they've largely become pretty rare too. So I would say my best guess, my wag on that, is a combination of the predators, you know, eating the eggs and then the lack of food for the species to survive. Um, just a little discussion on biodiversity and grasslands. You know, I first got interested in prairies because, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a botanist. I mean, plants are what I really became passionate about first with the gentians and the prairie lily and stuff. You know, you know so plants, you know, there's quite a few plants, but a few birds, a few vertebrates. Really what we have as far as remnant vertebrates would be like prairie voles. So we still have a population of prairie voles at the hogback, but they're largely disappeared too. But really, it's the invertebrates that make up the large percentage of biodiversity in these remnant sites today. So those are the grazers out there. Those are the seed dispersers. Those are the things keeping plants in check, right? So they're really contributing to function of these sites. So I think most people understand the idea. Most people, I hope, know what this is. This is a monarch caterpillar here. This is actually on purple milkweed, on state and danger purple milkweed, too. Kind of interesting. <laughs> so if you think of the monarch butterfly, and now let's, so that's host specific, right? They can only feed on milkweed. Now we have 11 species of milkweed, but now let's talk about some prairie plants. So as an example, lead plant, all these plants, a lot of them are host specific to a number of species and including, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 species could live on only on one particular plant species. Mm -hmm. So if you think of that connection of the invertebrates and their host plant, and I just use monarchs as an example, we believe in Wisconsin we have as many as 2,000 remnant dependent invertebrates on these remnant prairies. So this is just a, a little taste of some of those. A couple of butterflies that are, you know, juniper hairs, three tier and stuff like that. 
I'll go through a few lead plant flower moth, um, only found on lead plant, really cool, colorful day flying moth. Um, here's another example of lead plant flower moth. This is on Battle Bluff Prairie State Natural Area. Um, you know, the moth blends in with the color of the flower. They, the larvae eat the flower and the seeds and stuff like that, so pretty cool. So here's just a handful of things that we know of use lead plant or are host specific to lead plant. So what I'm trying to say is we don't know a lot that feed on these. So you know we are discovering new species to science on these prairies. So if you think you have to go to South America to find some new species to science, you don't. All you have to do is start rearing caterpillars that are on, on a, in a rare habitat, and you're going to be finding brand new stuff known to science. It's, it's not that uncommon. Actually, this little moth here, which I'm going to call lead plant gall moth, I'm the first one to document this in Wisconsin. By taking this, the moth pupates in there, I put that in a jar, and a moth came out, and I gave it to a moth expert, and it's, and it's this particular moth right here, lead plant gall moth. Um, juniper hair streak, what would you think the host of that would be? Junipers and red cedars, right? So oftentimes prairie managers cut and remove every cedar off a hillside, and that's standard practice, but if we want to maintain a few of these interesting butterflies whose host plant is the cedars, we want to leave a few cedars, maybe in the rock cliffs and stuff, but very beautiful Butterfly, tiny, about the size of a nickel. Um, that's from Battle Bluff State Natural Area there. Um, auto skipper butterfly, this one, unfortunately, has crashed in the Midwest. The only Midwest population. Um, you could find them up until about 2012, 2013. I still monitor and survey for this at the four sites that I managed that had this back in 2012. Twice a year I survey for this butterfly. Can't find them anymore. The only place they're found is Fort McCoy that actually has 16,000 acres of really high quality habitat. So a lot of these skippers are crashing range wide. Um, it's probably just lack of habitat, right? It's habitat fragmentation, so there's no breeding genetic exchange between populations and the genetics become, you know, they're just, they've gone down the toilet flush, essentially, unfortunately, you know. We think they've been just swirling around, barely surviving, now they've just crashed. So a lot of stuff. Um, this is a photo from Dr. James Steeler. He shared this with me, but these dry prairie sites actually have somewhere around 25 species of snails. So who would think snails grow on these harsh, dry sites? They're tiny, tiny little snails. One of them is called a winged snail tooth snail, which is a state threatened snail. So, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff on these sites. It's just really cool. So, we're getting close to the end, but this is actually a prairie remnant. Um, you can see these in the Kickapoo Valley. Um, just about any valley that has a south slope, you'll often see these hillsides covered with cedars. Oftentimes, underneath those is the whole prairie grasses and prairie forbs and flowers and stuff like that. Management is you get out, you cut brush. Uh, this is Sugar Creek Bluff State Natural Area owned by Mississippi Valley Conservancy by Ferryville, Wisconsin. Clearing that bluff up, burning the brush piles. You can see here's prairie grasses. So a lot of stuff survives under those cedar trees. Um, we do run prescribed fire through these sites. Um, this is an extreme photo. This is one I don't want my crew to post on Facebook and stuff. <laughs> you know, that's, that's something really new these days. But, um, you know, we have a, a put-together burn plan, and we have big fire breaks and stuff like that, and we're trained and that sort of thing. Actually, my crew and myself, we burned last weekend at Rush Creek State Natural Area and at Battle Hollow State Natural Area. We've got a couple good burns in. Um, this is burning at Battle Bluff State Natural Area, so extremely steep site. Um, we're only burning a portion because this was one of those auto-sampler sites. 
And that butterfly overwinters as larva at the base of the host plant, which is prairie grass. So you can imagine if you burn the base of the host plant and you're burning up the larva, well, fire might not be that compatible with it, correct? So you got to be really careful. It's really a delicate balance trying to hang on to all these species, and we don't know the life histories of most of them. So the best we can do is leave refugia where we can, and sometimes it's extreme. To, to be able to do that. So with that, I wound it down to the end. We've got a compass plant here in the sunset, and I have to throw this out to you, sorry, but um, this is my program, Bureau of Natural Heritage Conservation. So we are the ones with this license plate, the Eagle license plate. If you purchase this, part of that fund will go to our program. Our program acts like a nonprofit. More than half of our program runs on gifts and grants. If you buy this, or this, you can also donate through your tax checkoff. There's a little checkoff on the bottom. Donate to the Endangered Resources Fund. If you make a donation, the state will match that donation. So we don't get a lot of state funding, again. So we really run like a nonprofit. So I have to throw out a little, you know, throw that out to you. So with that, um, that's the end of my talk. Open for questions, comments, whatever you got for me. So. Thank you. Questions? Okay, how about you? The brittle cactus, how does it like uh, reproduce if it doesn't have a flower? Like what what does that look like? You um, said it didn't have a flower? Well, do you remember part of my conversation with the two is that it sticks on my boots? Oh, okay, like it uh, burns from the... <laughs> little, little pieces of, of cactus sticks to critters. Okay. And then that critter walks, and then that little thing falls off, and it'll root. Like a bird. Like a... Yeah, like a bird. You know, it's just a little pad. It's just a part of the cactus with the thorns. It just sticks in you, and when it falls off, and then it falls in an appropriate area. And it will produce with flowers, too, but it's just extremely rare. So it vegetatively reproduces. Um, behind. Does the Endangered Species Act, does that protect plants and insects too, or is that just mammals? Or Well, there's, there's two levels. So there's a state level. Every state has their level of rare species, and, and then there's that the federal level. So at the state level, private land plants are not protected. But animals are, so animals would include some invertebrates like the regal fritillary butterfly and that sort of thing. So, and other animals too, like, you know, some of our bats have become really rare and I rock now with white nose syndrome and stuff, so those are state threatened and that sort of thing. So, an insect that's federally listed, the first bumblebee in the nation, right? Rusty patch bumblebee. So, that's a federally listed bumblebee. And you know, as far as protection, I've read that they really only give you guidance with that, so it, it's, it doesn't really impact a lot. They just say, don't impact any area of habitat, say with nectar plants, don't impact more than a third of that if you're going to mow, if you're going to burn or something. So it's not really heavy-handed from the federal government telling you what to do, at least with that particular species. So. I found a prairie trillium in my backyard. Oh. Often around here. No. So it was actually a red color trillium? It's in the rope mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's really unusual. Because mm -hmm. usually we've got large flower trilliums, the big white ones now. The big white ones well turn pink with age. This is not a white. This is a prairie trillium. Yeah, so really small red flower on it then. Yeah, that's. And it doesn't stink. It's not a red trillium. Interesting. Wow, that's amazing. I know of them from eastern Wisconsin, and I've only seen that one time in my grandma's yard. I've been propagating it, so I've got a patch of it now, but I'm wondering if anyone would be interested in what? In, it, in your circles of rare um, No, if it's in your yard or something, but I wonder where it came from, though. I, I don't know the status because 
I guess I'm not super familiar with that species. I know it's in eastern Wisconsin. Maybe it's special concern, but but it is unusual and I would say uncommon for sure. Well, it's kind of it's it's on it's not like in a it's it's yeah. edges on a greenish space, so it's not a yard. Yeah, kind of a little wild area that's still there or something like that. And you know, being this was a big prairie at one time. And maybe they're not here because there's nothing left of that prairie, but there's little remnant bits, maybe yeah, a little. Yeah, it's so. Very interesting, though. I'm um, the gentleman behind. How do I educate myself to distinguish between the so called good thistles and the Canadian <laughs> thistles and the <laughs> invasive critters that want to take over every bit of my prairie? Well, there is a fairly easy way. Um, the native thistles tend to be soft to the touch when you put your hand on them and you pull against it. The non-native thistles are the ones that tend to be extremely prickly, prickly. So that's a general way to tell the difference. So if you can grab that and pull it. Now there's another way to tell too. With tall, right? Like you really want to be grabbing this. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's another way to tell field thistle and tall thistle. So look, this won't differentiate hills thistle, the state threatened one. But if you flip the, one of them is called Circium discolor, and that means that when you flip that leaf, it's white on the underside. So both tall thistle and pasture thistle are white. If you flip the leaf over, it's white. So if it's white on the back side of the leaf, that would be a native thistle too. Non-native thistles won't be white on the back side. So that's a good way to tell those. Hill's thistle, a way to tell that, is it has a red midrib, uh, has a red vein just going down the center of the leaf. But, you know, that would be probably only found, it can be found in pastures though, that have been grazed that are still remnant pastures most of the species are gone the remnant species are gone but some you know cattle don't like to eat thistles so you know hill thistle can be found in pastures still do you have any information on the um, the current bat population in southwestern Wisconsin like bacteria um well they've crashed mm -hmm. big time um, and I'm not a bad expert. We do have a bad program within Natural Heritage Conservation. They've, they've crashed. I mean, I've gone out with a few bad people, and we've looked at caves early in the spring, and we saw white nose on some of them, actually. You know, uh, but no, I don't know details. But yeah, they're pretty much there will be 1% of the population might survive, and that's the population we hope Mm -hmm. is immune and will hopefully, but think of the genetic bottleneck mm -hmm. that that's going to take those species through, unfortunately, and we hope. And, and you think of the economic impact because bats eat mm -hmm. European corn borer and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So from an agricultural standpoint, I mean, you know, economic impacts are unbelievable, what could be coming from our loss of bats. Go ahead. Um, I'm originally from New Jersey and New York State, and the same thing's going on over there with the white nose. Um, their habitat loss and plus that disease is wiping them out there too. So I had like no idea that how the extent, even to the Midwest, um, that this is affecting the bats. So it's scary to me. Yeah, it's it's a wave. It started out east, and it's just been a wave right across the United States, essentially. And I think it's moving more to the west. It might have already made it to the west coast. I'm not sure, but yeah, I know that's really scary. I mean, to think some diseases, and there's a lot of other diseases. There's snake fungal disease, which is killing snakes. You know, there's chytrid fungus with salamanders and frogs and stuff like that. So, yeah, there's a We've got a lot to work on, right? <laughs> and a lot of challenges to protect and manage and maintain all the really cool stuff we have in Wisconsin. Go ahead there, sir. Uh, somebody told me that if you buy, uh, like, flowering plants from box stores, for instance, they won't have the uh, 
the 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 minerals necessary for like caterpillars to fully develop? Is that have you ever heard anything like that? Oh, absolutely. It won't produce the nectar. So those would be cultivars. So you know, plants are hybridized in the plant industry. They're hybridized for their looks. They're not hybridized to produce nectar. So there's often a lot of native plants that they hybridize, but they hybridize the nectar pretty much right out. So although they look gorgeous and you get those, what, double flowers or whatever, where you get tons of petals versus one layer of petals, yes, they won't actually produce the nectar. That's why people largely recommend, you know, and, and monarchs are crashing and all that, is to use native plants and don't use cultivars of those native plants mm -hmm. too. So, you know, so I definitely recommend using native plants in your yard and, you know, pollinators are really struggling, right? I mean, we're getting rare bumblebees now. I mean, we've had 20, 25 species of bumblebees in Wisconsin. A lot of those we can't even hardly find anymore. And just 30 years ago, they were common. So, I mean, nature is struggling right now. You know, if, if people knew what I know and the crashes of all this stuff, it's like, my gosh, it's, you know, it, it, it is hard to live in the wounded world, right, and be an ecologist in the wounded world, as Anne Leopold said, when you know all the damage that's been done and how stuff is crashing, but we just keep hope and keep fighting and doing the best we possibly can to maintain habitats and managed sites and keep all the critters on the landscape the best that we can do, you know, and, and stuff. But go ahead. And... What's the percentage of the state of Wisconsin that is uh, subsidized corn and soy? Because when I grew up from New Jersey and um, also to D.C., Maryland, New York State, Pennsylvania, that whole trip, even from New York State to here, that whole trip, all I saw was just fields of corn and corn and corn, predominantly corn. And I see that here, too. Yeah. A lot of the landscape is like corn. So I'm curious, like, what's the percentage of the land that's used for monoculture in this state? And what is the state doing to preserve more of the natural lands, like all the habitats that you were pointing out today? Um, what is the state doing to preserve more of that? It's, I think, that's a mismanagement of land because there's a, it's just a cornfield. So the question was how much land in Wisconsin is dominated by agriculture, and I would say corn, beans, and let's just loosely say non-organic agriculture. And that's going to be a wag on my part, but I know the state very well. Northern Wisconsin is predominantly forested. I would say somewhere around a third of the state, so the driftless area, right, we've still got a lot of native habitat and that sort of thing, so I would say roughly a third, where you look at Iowa and it's like 95%. Now, what is the state, or, or we'll even take that a step further and say what is the government doing about that? So, you know, from a state perspective, we have a program like the Bureau of Natural Heritage Conservation housed within the DNR that searches out and finds these sites protects them and stuff like that, you know, and the state and federal government can't do it alone, so we partner with as many other conservation organizations like that we can, like Mississippi Valley Conservancy and the Prairie Enthusiast here, so, you know, leveraging resources that way to protect things. The federal government has a fair amount of programs through the Natural Resources Conservation Service, so we do a lot of our plantings, prairie plantings, at the Hogback Prairie State Natural Area with funding through Natural Resources Conservation Service. Now, the DNR is not eligible, but I work with a local farmer on that, so they provide dollars for pollinator plantings and stuff like that. They, there are programs that um, will provide funding to produce buffer strips along streams and stuff like that to help keep water cleaner and stuff like that and also have pollinator habitat along streams. And, and I'm not a federal employee, so I'm not an expert in that area, but, and you know, in Wisconsin we have a lot of national forests and stuff like that, but it really comes down, government can't do it on our own. We can't possibly protect what there is. So it really comes down to individuals 
you know, trying to do what you can on your own properties and that sort of thing, being cognizant of what's out on the landscape and that sort of thing, and doing pollinator plantings. If you don't own land and you just have a yard, you can grow milkweed, you can grow native plants and stuff like that. So, you know, there's a lot that can be done, but, you know, I'm concerned that we're not doing enough. Everybody isn't doing enough. You know, the human population, what, we're at 8 billion now or something? It's, there's a lot of people out there. And we, people need food and space to live. And unfortunately, that's taking habitat away from a lot of the critters and stuff like that. So. Well, we can coexist. We just have to be educated on how to do it. And there's, better, there's better farming practices to do. Uh, grow food, but diverse uh, food. Non-monocultures? Non yes. Right, so, and, and we know what happens when monocultures come, right? Stuff eventually crashes, whether it's red pine plantations and red pine pocket decline or, you know, corn diseases and soybean diseases and all that. So, so maybe two more questions right there in the back. I'd like to do a burn on my land and I'm finding it's difficult to find something to do it. And I wonder if you have any suggestions. Driftless land stewardship on the bay is the only place I found. Yes, and they're largely, they don't do, well, they will do a little burning maybe. Um, there is a local company called Nature Works that recently moved from central Wisconsin to this particular area. Also, Cooley Region Forestry is another. Um, group, you know, that does that type of work. So Nature Works is, they did live just 12 miles from Viroqua, and now I think they just bought a place down in the Kickapoo Valley someplace. But, so I actually hired them to do some cedar clearing at my place this last winter and stuff like that. So they were good to work with. And of course, I, as a state employee, I can't recommend. But on the side, as an individual, they were good to work with. So <laughs> wear a few different hats. So maybe one more question. OK, over here. I'm sorry, I've neglected this part of the room. I was wondering, you mentioned the snake fungus and kidred fungus. I was wondering if you the fungal kingdom. Do you know of any endemic mushrooms or mycorrhizal species? That are uh, common on Wisconsin's prairies? Um, well, morels, morchella, actually, big blue stem is a host of morels. So amazingly, after we do prescribed burns, there you can find morels on prairies. You know, it's not just elves. <laughs> They're horned dead apples. But. Well, thanks everybody for coming. It was great.